good evening, Hank Creek. God is good. Time of God is good. We want to thank uh, Deacon Close for opening up this evening and for our musician and uh, for all the testimonies. I sat and listened and uh, I think to most of them that I could hear. And uh, God has been good to you. I know he has been good to me. I know he's good to you because you're here tonight. You're breathing. You are alive and the Lord has blessed you one more time to be in the house of the Lord. Yet God is able. And that is where we have to trust. Thank you. God's word before I forget. Uh, that Romans 8 28 and we know that all things work together amen? amen so church don't miss moments take advantage of them if somebody runs across your mind make sure that you reach out to them um, if somebody if God places somebody on your heart make sure you reach out to them don't put it off and put it on the list and say, I'll get to it tomorrow. Go now. And sometimes it's inconvenient. Yet, God can do a great thing. Amen? Amen. Also, I want to remind you uh, that our youth are spearheading a uh, back-to-school revival. And there's flyers up. Sister Sabrina with her wonderful computer skills and then all that uh, great stuff has created some flyers and if you want to hand some out we have some extra. The youth went around town and handed out some today. So our youth are spearheading this along with some other youth from several different churches. August the 16th we will not have a service here. I hope you will come and support them in the revival, the rally however you want to call it, down at the city park uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, especially with our youth who are trying to do this, the Lord laid it upon their heart. We want to, to get behind them and, and, and be a part of it. Now, it says youth and young adult on it, but we certainly want the adults to come. And at the end of the night, what we hope is we have enough adults that we can surround them and circle around them, all who are going back to school, teachers likewise, young adults college age down to the babies that are going and pray for them there will be speakers there will be music uh, so please come out put that on your calendars and plan to support that amen amen, amen. all righty romans 8 i think i've said this several weeks in a row if you feel discouraged or down this is the chapter to read, and uh, I've been hit with several things, just just small things here and there. You know, when when you have a great victory, the enemy will hit you sometimes with lack attack. Y'all yeah. remember that sermon? Lack attack. Everything starts breaking. Stuff starts going off. I have a testimony tonight. You know, my wife and daughter, or my wife and myself, we could have been hurt majorly in a in a big. Uh, car crash or something we she got to the ramp yesterday after coming home from Athens and uh, the tire popped and blew right on the ramp at the hospital there and it was on the inside where you couldn't really see I had checked the tires and we had gone y'all know went to North Carolina a month or so ago went to Columbus multiple times just went to Dayton and I knew the car didn't quite but I knew we had a, a another issue going on I knew the brakes were about ready to be uh, looked at and lo and behold two tires with the wires on the inside and uh, you know what God is good and his mercy endureth to all generations so I'm praising God that's my testimony today and I thank God for another opportunity to even be here so and we know all things work together Sister Miller, glad to see you back. I meant to say that Sunday, and God blessed you all the way out to the to the plains and back. Amen. And she's back, and and I missed her Jesus, Jesus, as she says all the time. Amen. We praise God for her, and 
All of you, we're glad to see you this evening. Romans 8, 28 through, let's try to get to the end of the chapter this evening and see what we can do. Uh, as your handout says, do you have handouts? No. Oh. those out. Let's go on into the word this evening. Romans 8, 28. Where did, we, where did your handout last week end up on? So we, we didn't quite make there. Verse 30. Okay. All right. So will somebody read the caption that is on 28 on your last week's handout, please? If you have it. Power verses. Yep. So we know the first part is the most quoted. The last part shouldn't be ignored. God is working in our lives for our good, and it is according to his purpose, which we learn to accept. Most people want his good according to their liking, yet sometimes his good is not always to our liking. This gives a whole new meaning to the saying God is good. God is good even though when we are not mm -hmm. or, feel, or don't feel good. Mm -hmm. or see the good. God's main purpose is to conform us to the image of his son. We can only receive all <laughs> things when it when we conform to Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So I heard my pastor say it this way and I liked how he said it and I kind of I kind of took it. In fact I've taken he told me his stuff's not copyrighted so I've taken all his stuff. <laughs> but uh, he said it this way. God is so in love with his son, y'all heard this, that he wants to populate the universe with those who look like him. He wants to conform us to the image of his son. So therefore, I'm going to have to make copies, sorry. Therefore, here's what's going to happen. We have to go through some things. You just don't come into the world naturally looking like Jesus Christ. Amen? You got to go through some things to, to, for us to be like him, uh, for us to, to think like him. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It takes some trials and some tests and some hardships and some purifying, as, as Peter talked about it. It takes some of those things, us going through them in order to be like Christ. None of us come here with the idea that I want to be like Jesus. We have to be saved first. And, and then the Lord begins to work on us, not only for salvation at the beginning, but he begins to work on our lives progressively to make us look like Christ. And then ultimately we will be just like him. But that's the work in progress. So, you know, that's the truth of that verse 28. And we know. And we know all things. All things would be even bad things. Good things. Bad things. Things that are uncomfortable. Things that are good. Anything. God can use it to uh, grow us and conform us to the image of his son. It, it has been my teaching philosophy for years. And they first, um, when we used to have to go into the, the College of Education, I remember sitting there in front of uh, several of the deans and prospective teachers, and they would ask you, what is your, as you're a new educator, what is your educational philosophy? Well, I didn't have all those big words and stuff that all some of those other folks said. I just simply said it this way. I said, I think I have an eclectic approach to the fact that I believe you can learn from anything around you. And that was kind of where I left, and they looked at it and thought, well, okay, all right. 
But you know what? Spiritually speaking, God can use the good, the bad, and the ugly to turn us in the direction he wants us to go. I, I challenge you this evening, we don't have time to, to discuss it, but look back over your life and look at the good things he's used. But also look at the bad things that he's used to, to shape you and to push you and to, to prod you. Uh, you know, He can even use things that you would never even dream of to make you go in the direction that you need to go. Somebody read the, because I don't have last week's handout in front of me, but uh, 29, is there a, a caption for 29? This is not simple reference to God's omniscience. He knew who would come to Christ, but it speaks to a predetermined choice. Mm -hmm. he, is, he set his love on us Amen. and established an intimate relationship. Election is a key doctrine in the New Testament church. Amen. Thank you. So, oh, you, oh, it's got First Peter one, uh, one and two. Elect means picked out or chosen. Yes. All so right. those whom God has chosen, He has desired and destined for His chosen end, mm -hmm. like His Son. This is the prize of the upward call. Colossians one twenty eight. Philippians 3, 20 through 21, subdue in Philippians means to arrange or to put in military order militarily. Mm -hmm. Christ will bring order to the chaos. Christ is not our model, and Christ is our model in every way, including our final bodies. He is the firstborn of many brethren. We are guaranteed bodies like his glorified, glorious body. Christ is preeminent. There is none like him. Amen. Amen. So that overlaps perfectly where we pick up this, uh, this week. So if you look at your handout, jump down to verse 28. You can read the opening on your own. We already pretty much covered that. Uh, we know what the will of God is, is to make us like his son. Verse 28 then says, them who are the called, called means ordained or divinely selected and invited. God has sent us his irresistible grace. Now let's deal with that, underline that on your handout uh, for just a moment. Anybody ever heard of that term, irresistible grace? All right. In Tulip. Yeah. Yep, in Tulip. All right, so we won't go into four-point and five-point Calvinist tonight. I didn't come to do that, uh, but and I know different people different with that. I am a four-pointer. Uh, I know some people are maybe five-point, but here's what I do believe is this, uh, and I explained it to several of you, and I've talked about it here recently with a good friend of mine. You know, here's God's choosing. If I walk to this door and picture where the exit sign is, it would say, choose Christ. Choose Christ as your Savior. Accept the Lord. Now, at that moment when I walk through that door and I look or at least walk to the beginning of it, I have an option. I can walk on through and me walking through is me choosing Christ or I can go my own way. And really, that's, that's where we are with the world. I mean, that matches up perfectly with Sunday sermon. Either you come to God on his terms, or you, come, or you don't come to God and choose your own terms. You have the way of Cain, or you have the way of Abel. So if that is the case, and I walk on through, but when I get just on the other side of the door, I look back, and there's another sign at the top that says, I chose you already. That is defining what predestination and calling and election is. Now, it can be like a dog chasing its tail, so to speak, although our dog can get his tail. But anyway, that's beside the point. It, 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 it can really lead you. It can make your mind go like this. Here's the point. We accept these things by faith. All right? I wasn't in eternity past, and I don't even begin to try to know the complete mind of God. But here's what I can settle on, and I pray you settle on tonight. I'm glad he chose me. 
I'm glad he chose me to put him in his son. Put me in his son. I am in Christ and he is in me. I am chosen. I am predestined. All right? Now, if you look at it, called means ordained or divinely selected or invited. So we give the invitation. We give the invitation to come to Christ. Yet here's the point. Irresistible grace is if God is going to save you, if he has chosen you, you at one point, you will not be able to resist his grace. Now, I don't know how you can explain it. I don't know your situation and to steal a, a phrase from the, the, the song, yes, God is real. I cannot tell just how you felt when Jesus washed your sins away. But here's how I felt. I felt the Lord's calling on my life. Even as a young child, I felt him grabbing. I felt him reaching. I felt him pulling. I felt the Holy Spirit. There were times that I really, in the sermons, before I acknowledged that I wanted to be a Christian and I wanted to be saved and I accepted Christ, I felt the conviction power of the Holy Spirit. Anybody else in here with me? That was his irresistible grace. It's like that fish on the end of the line. You're hooked. And you can't get free. Amen. 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 Anybody else there? You you know, I, I used to take kids fishing, the sixth graders. Woo! You talk about a task. But I do remember this. There were times when you would that kid didn't want to touch the fish, and you would have to get the hook out. You all been there. Maybe you take your kids, your grandkids. There's a hook sometimes that can be pretty deep. Yeah. Pretty deep. Well, that's how the Lord hooked me. He got deep down inside of me and he hooked me and he began to reel praise the name of the Lord Thank you. he began to reel me in and I'm thankful yes. I don't know why I act a fool sometime I'm trying to teach tonight act crazy and shout and, and all these other things because I know what the Lord did for me yes. amen yes. his irresistible grace Basically meaning whom God foreknows. Wow. He calls and they come. Jesus said it in the New Testament. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. Yep. And they come to me. Amen. So that word for no. Wow. Wow. And so I begin to think about this just as even as late as just sitting there in the office listening to you all. And Psalms 139 and verse 17 and, and 18. Psalms 139, I think, verse 17 and 18. So do you all, if you all believe the truth of the scripture, what, what does that say? Psalms 139... 17 and 18. If you have it, say amen. amen. This is probably one of my favorite passages in Scripture. You all know my stories. Laying face down on the beach and looking at all that sand. How precious, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Now, let's pause for a moment. Whom he did foreknow. That means he had foreknowledge of you. He knew you before you were, go back to the beginning of that same psalm, you were knitted together in your mother's womb. And if his thoughts of you are more than the sand of the sea, which we can't even begin to measure how many pieces of sand are in the sea. Now, God's infinite. I get it. But that means he's been thinking of you for a long time. He knew when you would fall for him, hook, line, and sinker. And he had thoughts of you before you were you. And then after you were born, every single thing in your life he has orchestrated so that you might get to the point 
that when he called you, you would come. Wow. When you understand this, look at that last line, underline this. When you understand this, it gives you a circle that different love of God. There are some folks in the church say, I love God. And maybe they're saying it just in word only. But there are some folks in the house of the Lord that they love him because they know exactly what he's done for them. They grasp it. They, they get it. They understand it. They, they get where they were and what he's done and what he's doing. And they get the idea that he foreknew me. He knew everything you would do. Now, now get that. Let's, let's deal with that for a moment. He knew all about you. He knew you would fall before you fell. He knew you would sin. He knew you would do wrong. He knew you, you would turn away from him. He knew you would backslide. Whatever. I'm trying to get everybody's category tonight. He knew you would sin. And yet he still called you. Amen. For knowledge. Write that down. That's not on your handout. Psalms 139, 17 and 18. There are so many other verses, but we must hurry on this evening. We must hurry on. Verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did what? Predestinate. Predestinate. To be what? There's that word. Conform to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Firstborn of what? From the dead. From the dead. Now how does that translate to us? Resurrection. Yeah. So y'all believe that, right? If you live long enough and you die in Christ, one of these days he will resurrect you. But Christ is the firstborn. He's the first. He's Colossians. Paul said to Colossians, he is the preeminent. He is he's the firstborn of many brethren. So that is also part of the conforming, making us into his image. I still can't, we can't get away from it. He has set us in his love. That is positionally in Christ. He is progressively working on us, and ultimately, we will be just like him. And in order to do that, we'll have to be translated, either raptured, and that rapture would be raised from the dead, or, or, or caught up as we're alive. Amen? Now, a lot of people believe the rapture, it, it is imminent, and they think that it, it could be within, and it could be, the next minute. But it could be 10 years down the line. I don't know. I don't understand and don't see God's uh, certain his calendar. It's, it's his business. He'll do what he wants. But here's the thing. No matter where I am, I will be immediately, because I'm in Christ, glorified as I meet him in the air. Now, the application of this verse here is, and this is where the rubber meets the road, church. This is why I said what I said at the beginning of the lesson concerning. We don't know who is elect. That's right. It is none of our business go around and say, well, you can be saved, but you can't be saved. They'll never be saved. Maybe those words have come out of your mouth. Maybe those words have come out of your mouth about a family member that has done something or maybe has done. You don't know who will be saved. We're sitting in a room full of folks and maybe somebody said that about us. We don't know who is elect. We don't know who God has foreknown and who he has predestined, who he will call. So our goal as the church is to carry out Matthew 28, 19, 20. Go ye therefore to carry out Acts 1, 8, and you shall be my witnesses to carry out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we do our job, God does the rest. The Holy Spirit does the rest. All we can do, Miss Shirley, is sow the seed. And let God take care of the increase. Let God take care of the growth. 
So many times I have left the pulpit, left behind here, felt discouraged, felt like I didn't do enough. Nobody came to the altar. Nobody came here. Nobody did this. There was no big anything that happened. And the Lord has to settle me down and remind me it's not up to you to do anything but just preach my word. I'll do the rest. Maybe somebody else in here has witnessed to somebody. Nothing happened. Nothing has happened. It appear, appears they went even a wrong direction. It is not up to you. God does the calling. Amen. 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 God, who is omnipotent, he knows who will come, who won't. And we can claim that promise of 829 because of the purpose of 829. He is conforming those whom he wants, those whom he calls. Go, go to 2 Timothy 2.19, please. Second Timothy 2.19. And it reads, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's a wonderful point that Paul uh, puts out there for young Pastor Timothy. God knows who, who belongs to him. And those who belong to him will depart. They'll, they'll steer clear of, they'll, they'll depart from iniquity. Amen? God holds his church accountable to tell people that truth. He holds his preachers accountable to preach and say that those who are saved are also delivered from the body of sin and, and they will still steer, steer clear or get away from iniquity or depart from sin. Now, does that mean you won't sin? No, but it certainly doesn't also mean that you remain in all kind of sin and say, well, I'm saved and I can also do what I want. God knows those who are his. Now, we don't know, but I'm going to tell you what, it'll be evident and clear in eternity. God, the Bible says very clearly and plainly, God will separate what? The wheat from the tear. The sheep from the goat. He'll separate. He will separate. Amen? Verse 30. As we hurry on. So note, that all the verbs in this verse are in past tense. What does that mean to you? It's already done. Yeah. So if you all paid attention in grammar class, I, I tried. It wasn't my favorite class. Amen. But I, I tried to pay attention. So what I do remember is this. Uh, anytime you added an ED, that means it had already happen. So here it is. In the mind of God, before you were you, he had already predetermined to do these things in your life. What did he predetermine? That he would call you, he would justify you, and he would ultimately glorify you. Along the way, don't forget, it's not in the verse, but it is in the text. He will also sanctify you. That means continually keep setting you aside for his purpose. Amen? Amen. So that being, being said, great question. Why faint under the sufferings of this world? Thank you, Lord. When we have already been glorified and we simply wait for the revelation of this glory at the return of Christ. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Why faint? There, therein lies your question, Miss Sabrina, about life being so hard. She asked that several weeks ago. The Christian walk. Why faint under these things? And we do. Amen. When we know that the Lord has already given us the victory. Because we're human. We're human. We go to tears. We cry. We hurt. We moan. Last week, we groan. We complain. 
Even though we sing the song, I won't complain, we do. I said that last week as well. We hurt, we, 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 we go through stuff. Nobody in here knows truly what all you've gone through or what I've gone through. But why faint under those things when we know that the Lord has won us the victory? Amen? Now, so here's the deal. If he had foreknowledge of us and he decided before and decreed beforehand in eternity, that's predestined us, and then he took the time to call us, to give us his name. Y'all know that? He's placed his name upon us, saved us, put it, take us all out of the marketplace and redeemed us, and then he justified us. That's the part right there that gets me. He cleared our name, placed his name on us, and declared us not guilty, and is bringing us to a place of honor and splendor. If we know that, that should change the perspective of how we live. It's easy to live a, with a defeatist attitude. Everybody's not always, y'all have somebody like that on your work or in your family. They just, when you see them, whoo, it's like you run into a ray of sunshine. Everything's blooming and bubbling everything. But then you look at you and you are Nancy never or you know whatever. Just negative Nancy, whatever. You just, you know, you just go through those days. I'm talking to somebody in here. When that comes, I told you, when that comes here's the passage. God, you've already predestined me. I predestined me for salvation, and you've saved me, and you are glorifying me, and you are working in my life. You are sanctifying me. You have set me aside. You have placed your name on me. Help me to live according to those truths. When I would be negative, when I would be doubtful, I'm all over my feet. When I would just say, I, I'm done. I throw in the towel. I'm tired of all of it. Yeah. Let me go somewhere. I just kind of thought that just, I, I just won't be on a deserted island somewhere. Yeah. God says, no, I've called you. And I will, I will make provisions for you. Then that's when it gets really good because you stop and you pause and you take a deep spiritual breath and then you look back over your life and you say, God, why do I doubt that you can't do it now when you've already done it? Hallelujah. Every single time he's, he steps in. So why faint under these sufferings? And here's the deal. Christ has already said, you will suffer. All those who, who choose to live godly lives, that's in the scripture. We'll suffer. We'll go through some things. That's, that's what's coming up next. But we don't have to faint under them when we know the truth of God's word. Amen. Brother Deodis Conwell, you sing a song. We tried to sing it for the association last year. We didn't get to be. He said there's a brighter day ahead. Amen. Now, Paul then settles in in verses 31 through 35 quickly with five questions. Pretty good questions, too. And he answers them in the text. Let's, let's take a look at this. In verses 31 through 35, he says, What shall we say then to these things? What are all these things? The things that we have just learned. The things that are happening to us. The things that, that he has presented, the things that, that are doctrines that he has presented, justification and, and, and God's grace and his salvation. What shall we say to these things? It's kind of the pivot moment of the, of the chapter and also of the first eight chapters. What shall we say, Romans? What shall we say, Christians, to these things? 
The answer is there's nothing we can say to these things because here's the deal. If God be for us, right. you got to grab that tonight. Amen. Who can be against us? We have to be reminded of that. What can come against us? Who can be against us? If God, who has done all these things, foreknew me, predestined me, called me, saved me, if he has known me and has done all these things, if he's done this and taken the time to do it, who can be against us? Yes, sir. Uh, I like to relate it to uh, when we used to pick teams to go on uh, basketball or dodgeball, baseball, yeah. whatever. Uh, and some somebody always got picked last. Sure did. <laughs> sure did. But they got picked. At least. They got picked, yeah. You know what, and Brother Smith, in my teaching career, those have been some of the times in my life that, that kind of have made me sad. It, it's rough to be that last kid, and you know, that you want to play, you want to fit in, but maybe you're not as tall, maybe you're not as fast, and, and kids can be mean. Y'all have heard me say this umpteen times. And to be that last one pick. And that's why I would go down when my body would permit me. And I would play recess every day. Yeah. And I would pick a team and i say, I want him. Yeah. Some kids go, why are you picking him first? Because <laughs> I want him on my team. And to see that kid puff up yeah. and play better and think better. And you know what? Kind of kind of rerouted. I never had any problem with him in class after that. Or her. You know why? Because it got picked. So my point is, and what he's saying is, when we know we've been picked, we can bear up under these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If God is for us, if he's picked us, who can be yeah. against us? Christ has done it all. Amen? Yes. That question there in, in 31, what shall we say? If God be for us, what can, who can be against us? I have written in my Bible a long time ago, who can hold you back? Now, Let's take a moment. If the Lord has spoken something into your life by his word, and you know you're supposed to be doing it, you know most of the time who holds you back? You. Now, yes, there are those. We know the enemy brings things against us. We know he can use people against us. He can use all sorts of things. And adversity comes our way. And here's what I've done in my life. A lot of times it has been me that held me back from God's purpose. Amen. Who can be against us? Who can hold you back? If God's for you, no one. That next question. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Wow. So not only is God for us, but he wants to give us his best. How do we know he wants to give us his best? Because he's already done it. What did he give me that is his best? He gave his only begotten son. Do y'all see how that links up? Christ uh, uh, is is. God's only begotten son, but Christ is also God's greatest gift. Well, that's why we as preachers spend the whole Advent season trying to get folks to be reminded that the greatest gift is not the one under the tree, but the one that hung on the tree. Hello, somebody. Jesus is God's greatest gift. So if God has given his greatest gift, will he not give you good things? But here is the key. Look at this. Answering this question, if God gave us his best, Jesus, then nothing else is off limits that lines up with God's will. Now, God, you said, who can be against me? If you're for me, who can be against me? Here, here's what I need. Your word also said, all we need to do is ask and knock and we shall receive. I need a million dollars right now. God said, well, that's not in my will. Sorry. Sorry. That, that, that's the difference. I don't have time to chase that rabbit, but you all do know that's where the prosperity gospel takes big root. 
what I want, God give it to me. And God is saying that I'm not that type of God. I give you what you need. So when the sufferings come and when the lack attack comes and when the door on the refrigerator falls off and the car stops working and this stops working and you, your eyesight's not right and all these other things, it seems like everything's breaking down. We need to remember to pray, God, you won't withhold any good thing from us. So give me what I need when I need it. That's a different way to pray. Not, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me grocery list. Which is my command. But give me what I need when I need it. He spared not his own son. Therefore, will he withhold any good thing from you? No. But the key is good thing. If it's not good for you, he won't give it to you. So God knows you don't need that million dollars because it won't be good for you. You be done left and went somewhere and gone and, and gone again and next thing you know you just gone. You don't need. Yeah, I got money. I don't need to trust the Lord. You get the point. So keep that in mind. Who then? Let's move on. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? What a powerful question. No one. Why? We are not guilty. Romans 8, 1, beginning of the chapter starts out. There is therefore now what? No, no condemnation. So we are not guilty. God is the final judge and he, praise God, has ruled in our favor, not because of us, but because of his son. Amen. So, you know, a lot of news about indictments. Amen. But get this. We're not indicted in God's court. Amen. Really, these questions, you could set them up and say this is just like a courtroom scene. And, and the prosecutor is asking these questions. Uh, what are you saying about these things? What are you, uh, who can lay anything to God's elect? Well, right. and, and, and Christ answers, there's nothing you can lay to my father's children's account. I've already paid it. Amen. Amen. Who is he that condemns us? Yeah. Next question. We're not condemned. Christ took care of that. That is the importance of Calvary. He, he freed us through the power of his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And even now, he is taking care of us as the Bible says he sits at the right hand of the Father. Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Turn to Hebrews 4, yes. 14. Hebrews 4, 14. Couldn't get away from it, could we? Oh, Romans and, and Hebrews are going to keep overlapping. Why? Because all scripture is given. <laughs> it is profitable. Amen. Look at what Hebrews 4, 14 says. Seeing then that we have a great. Tell your neighbor, Christ is greater. Christ is greater. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing now that we then we have a great high priest. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast to our profession. The profession of our faith. Hebrews 4.14. Again God is judge. But here's the good news. Our divine lawyer. Our divine mediator. Our divine intercessor is Christ. And God is in love with his son. And he will take his son's word for it. Isn't that a powerful thing? Amen. So when I'm in Christ and he's in me, I'm covered and he has, God has taken his son's word concerning me. I love that. Last question then says, who shall separate us then from the love of Christ? You are not condemned. You're in favor of God. If God is for you, who can be against you? And then the last question, who can separate us from the love of Christ? And then Paul here uses some, some astronomical terms, some space terms, neither height nor depth. Now, there's a question. Now, I've been teaching about space for a long time, and I will ask the kids this, and sometimes I think, you know, is it too much for them because my little brain can't handle it and I wonder can theirs and you see their wheels start turning. I said so they launch these spaceships stick with me for just a moment 
out from usually Houston, or they return to Houston and out from Florida. Yeah. Florida is about at the middle of the globe, and I don't have a, a sphere in here, but if you can imagine, well, this is a sphere. Florida is about at the middle of the globe, and so they go out into space that way. They go up and out into space. I said, what if they were to put a space station at the North Pole and then just launch straight up? and just keep going. What's up there? We know what's out in space. And then I said, what if they were to put one at the bottom? By the way, if you're in the, on the South Pole, are you actually standing upside down? Because you're on the bottom of the earth. Think about it, that'll make your brain hurt. But what if they put a space station there and launched a, space, a spaceship that way? Could you keep going in every direction to infinity and beyond? Yes. Every direction you go off the earth, it goes infinitely until God says stop and man hasn't built a telescope powerful enough to see to a certain point he doesn't even know what's out there. But here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, I am persuaded that neither height Y'all catch it? Yeah. No matter how far you go out into space, nothing is so high out there that it can separate you from the love of God. Yeah. Nor depth. Whether you go deep into the earth or deep into space or high into space, nothing that God has created can separate you from the love of Christ. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Yeah to grasp hold of tonight. Paul then names a list of these things that will come to the believer. Now this is where again, you won't hear this in just any church. You, you won't hear this because a lot of days today they paint everything in a nice rosy picture. But here's what he said. These things can come, but they can't separate you. Tribulation, which means pressure and affliction. Anybody ever been in a spiritual pressure cooker? Oh, I'm in here by myself. I'm going to ask you a question. Speak up like you hear me. Yes. Have you been in a spiritual pressure cooker? Yes. Yes. You didn't know which way to go. Yes. And the heat was turned up and you were like the Hebrew boys, so to speak. It was just, it was a tough trial. Let that question ring true tonight. Who can separate you from the love of Christ? No one. Have you been in distress? That, that literally means to be in between a rock and a hard place. Narrowness of way to be between a rock and a hard place. Anybody experience, and if you haven't, you will. You experience any persecution. That means you've been mistreated. Yes. Cause of how you feel, how you believe, what you believe, who you believe in. Anybody ever been without scarcity of food? The, the early church, they knew what that was like. That's why they had to have all things in common. They had to share amongst them houses. They, they knew what it was like. But see, we in America, sometimes we've gotten fat. What am I talking about? I'm not talking about your size. I'm talking about the fact that we have gotten soft to the point that we don't have to go through any persecution. So therefore, everything is nice and, and full and, in, and right in front of us. We don't care about persecution because it hasn't happened yet. Hello, somebody. What about famine? Anybody ever gone through that? Nakedness, peril. That means dangers, toils, and snares. Heaven forbid the sword. Go to a different continent. It's happening. Africa. It's happening. They're coming into villages and killing Christians. Other places. You just wait. You will go through some things. Paul is saying you go through these things. Even those things cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know tonight? Now, how can Paul say this? We don't have time to look at it. 2 Corinthians, write it down, read it when you get home. Paul is saying this when you read that and when you read it in context of Romans. I've tried him and I know him. Hallelujah. Can anybody have that testimony in here tonight? I've tried him, and I know him. Hallelujah. Been snake bitten, shipwrecked. 
I've been through some things, but what I found out is I, that the Lord will not leave me. Nobody can separate me from the love of Christ. I've been through some stuff that ordinary folks would have turned around and, and went back another way. But I have found out God is faithful. Amen. He is true to his word. So by Paul answering these questions clearly based on God's word, there is no need for us to fret over what God will do. I can still hear my mom saying this, and I, I, I have shared this with you before. She said, you know, when they get ready to have the Gulf War and all these news stories, and you know the news pumps things up, and they were talking about I'd never heard of a Scud missile and, and the attacks and all that was getting ready to happen there in 90, 91, whenever it happened. She said, whatever God will allow, it's going to happen. So all you need to do, Christian, is trust him, and he will take care of it. Wow. Wow. That's a seasoned person that's been through some storms. That was me at 19 years old, not, not thinking about who God was, but worrying about what was going to happen to me. But now somebody says, you just live a little bit and you find out who God is. Can I ask you tonight who he is? Has he brought you through some trials, some tests? And are you still standing in the better for it? Who can separate you from the love of Christ. Amen. Look at what he says here. And then we'll close this out. He says in verse 30, 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Yes. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Amen. That simply means, again, saints, we can't get around it. We're going to have sufferings in our lives. But I'm just going to close that out, that verse there, by just simply saying, but he promised. Yes. Circle that on your handout so you are reminded. We go around sometimes with, with fear of the trouble rather than focusing on the one who can handle the fear. 37 then uses a word. Nay, in all these things, we are more than hooper nikayo. Hooper nikayo, which means we are hyper conquerors. I don't know how you are more than a conqueror, but it, this is a pitiful example. But there are teams that when they play the game, and my, my favorite game is football, they, they may have closed the score out and they won the game 20 to 6. It was competitive. It was an interesting game. It went down to the fourth quarter. There, there were some times when the outcome was in doubt, but then that team scored a touchdown late and sealed the deal. This Hooper Nikeo means there's never a doubt from the moment they step on the field who wins. And as the game is played out, they win, and they win beyond convincingly. Do y'all catch that tonight for yourself? You are greater than a conqueror. Amen? Yes, sir. Uh, didn't Jesus say before he went to, to the cross, he said, uh, I have overcome the world. Mm -hmm. So, it's, the fight's rigged. Mm -hmm. God God wins. He already wins. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's why we're born. So there's no doubt we are greater than conquerors. That last section then says simply, what Paul closes out with, therefore, because of this, I am what? Persuaded. Stop right there. Church, that's where we have to be. <laughs> Persuaded. Amen. Persuaded in your praise. Persuaded in your position. Amen. Even persuaded in your predicament. Persuaded in your praise. How you give God the glory or you don't. Amen. Persuaded in your position where God has placed you. Yes. And even when these trials and tests that Paul named come along. Persuaded even in the predicament. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present. Nor anything that's coming in the future. Can I ask you one more question? Have anybody in here ever been scared or concerned or, or worried? Mm -hmm. 
about the future. Yeah. What the future holds. Paul is saying here, you don't have to worry about it. I know who holds the future. I know who holds my hand. He's saying, I am persuaded that none of these things shall be able to separate, neither height nor depth nor any other creature. That includes the powers of hell. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God which has been displayed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Nothing can separate us. Praise God. Even upon death, the believer, Paul bared this out later. He said, be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The unknown cannot separate us. Amen. I pray you've been encouraged tonight, and I pray you leave here persuaded. Persuaded that he who has begun a good work in you is able to perform it till the day of his coming. Questions or comments? I just want to comment that, uh, you know, the, the disciples, when they first uh, were beaten, for Christ, mm -hmm. they they rejoiced they, they, that they were counted worthy mm -hmm. to suffer shame for His name. You know, so you look throughout there and you read like we just read the, the, the Hebrews eleven, the heroes of faith, yep. and they said they they chose uh, suffering or whatever to obtain a better. Re a re resurrection mm -hmm. so it's like not willing or not choosing not to be delivered yeah <laughs> not to, yeah. You know, so it's like wow well, they cho chose not to be delivered in order they're looking at treasure in heaven they're not and he, and, I, and I know they're talking about heaven because when he was talking about uh, uh, Abraham he said he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God yeah, so everything was all about heaven and not the earth. What is telling in that, if you all could hear him in the back, the disciples obviously experienced persecution, is a number of times that they were in jail and the Bible did not say that they were up pacing, putting a cup on the bars, <laughs> hollering, screaming, let me out of here. They were either asleep or they were praying or play, praising God. Peter was asleep with the imminent next day he was going to be executed. He was asleep. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises to God. Amen. So, therefore, they were persuaded. Something within persuaded them. And I believe that in these last days in which we're living, church, we, we've got to have some persuaded Christians. Amen. Yeah. I know in whom I believe. You can't make me doubt him. You can't make me turn around. You can't make me renounce who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. While we're there tonight, before I forget, and we've alluded to it already, but if there is anybody that will listen to this, anybody that does not know Jesus, Jesus Christ, God's only son, suffered, bled, and died. On the cross of Calvary, he was buried, and thanks be to God, on that third day, he rose again with all power in his hands. He has that same power today, and that power is enough to save anybody and persuade anybody of who he is. I pray you've trusted in him. If you have not, why not and when? Tomorrow is not promised. I just gave that testimony at the beginning of the lesson. It is not promise. Choose the Lord today. Amen. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me, we thank God for his word this evening. We thank God for that powerful eighth chapter of Romans. Amen. God, we bless you tonight. We praise you for we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and you have done more for us than we could even imagine. We thank you for your word. We thank you for 
the strength that your word uh, brings us and gives us and the peace that your word gives us. Let us walk now persuaded and, and, and ready, um, Lord, to, for the challenge of spreading and sharing the gospel. Help us to focus on those things that are most important. God, as I had in the handout, but I didn't say during the class, we sometimes can make church into what it's not supposed to be. Help us to keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is Jesus Christ is the center of it all. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for his supreme sacrifice. Now give us the strength to walk as you would call us and as, as you would have us. In Jesus' name, and we thank you for all of the prayer requests, those who have needs tonight. We ask that you will bless the family that is bereaved this evening, uh, those who yesterday at this time had a loved one and now they don't. I pray that you will walk along beside them and comfort them, those who are experiencing health crisis and trials and troubles. Thank you for delivering and bringing Brother Dotson to us this evening. Lord, you know what all is going on with me, and I pray that you will touch me as well. God, I pray for all those who are experiencing uh, difficulties and things in their lives. Uh, we pray for our youth revival, Lord, that somebody will be saved. We pray that you will send the right message for the right time with the right people. We pray for the singers and the event and all that will transpire. God, and we give you the glory and honor that you so richly deserve. There is none like you. You are a great God, a great king above all kings. Bless now and give traveling grace home. And as we assemble back in this place, if it be your will on Sunday, Lord, give us a word, another word about faith that will strengthen us and help us in our walk with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.